Hello, and welcome to my channel. This is your favorite YouTube sensation, Benjamin Boyce. And I found something very fascinating for me. There's a research paper that argues for intersectionality within the field of psychological research. And it shows very explicitly that intersectionality is not concerned with empirical science and finds empirical science to sideline it epistemologically. And it's just right out in the open. So I wanted to go through this paper just to show that intersectionality really does understand itself as an activist-based uh, motivated reasoning rather than some sort of pursuit of truth. It's pursuing action. It's pursuing what they call justice. So let's dive in. Intersectionality in psychological science. Intersectionality research in psychological science Colon, resisting the tendency to disconnect, dilute, and depoliticize. Psychological science has been slow to incorporate intersectionality as a concept and as a framework for conducting research. Although there has been an increase in the use of the term, it is rarely centered in mainstream psychology publications. It is not taught as a research framework and is commonly misunderstood and undervalued. As both a theory and an analytic framework, intersectionality has been subject to epistemic exclusion, rendering it largely invisible in psychology and cast to the margins of the field. When intersectionality is brought into mainstream psychological research, it is depoliticized, disconnected from its social justice framework, and diluted, typically incorporating more than one social identity, e.g. race and gender, analytically, but failing to utilize the other core components of intersectionality, see Table 1. As a consequence, psychological research and the field as a whole have not benefited from the transformative potential that emerges from intersectional practice. Now, the basic first question you should ask is, is intersectionality as a framework or an analytical uh, toolkit, does that jive well with empirical research? Is intersectionality science? Or is it rather a political framework that is based in this thing called social justice that turns what is research into something that is not research anymore. Intersectionality, a primer. Intersectionality as a conceptual framework has been central in black feminist activism and scholarship for nearly 200 years. What? Sojourner Truth delivered her I Ain't a Woman speech at the 1851 Women's Rights Convention, where she called out the hypocrisy of abolitionists and white suffragettes, which center either white women or black enslaved men, and rendered the unique expression experienced by black women invisible and undefended. For nearly two centuries, women of color activists, and eventually women of color, lesbian and transgender scholars, have been vocal about oppression at the intersections of classism, racism, heterosexism, ableism, and xenophobia. In 1989, black feminist scholar Kimberly Crenshaw presented a framework for intersectionality theory, naming the construct and unifying a long history of scholarship and activism. So, right out the gate, they're saying that intersectionality is not based on science. It's based on activism. Activism is about getting what you want. Science is about trying to see what is there. At this point in psychology, many understand intersectionality as a focus on overlapping identities, such as being both black and female, yet dismiss the other core tenets of intersectionality theory, particularly its central focus on social justice. I hope they define social justice. A critical contribution of intersectionality theory is that it centers understanding how a given phenomenon is inextricably intertwined with societal institutional structures and interlocking systems of privilege and oppression. So science is trying to figure out what's concretely there, what can be falsified as not true, and what can be repeated as true over and over and over again. You can repeat the experiment. Intersectionality and social justice are about imposing in every given instance this rubric of privilege and oppression 
intersectionality is about projection of what you want to be there or what you suppose to be there in order to reconfigure a power structure in order to get what you want. Science doesn't do that. Science and intersectionality are at odds from the get-go. Work that is based in intersectionality theory intentionally focus on the, quote, forces that create the outcomes, not just their static products. For example, an intersectional analysis would center institutionalized discrimination in medical training and racist and sexist biases of providers as the dynamic factors impacting the disparate health outcomes between black and white women in the U.S. So basically, intersectionality will see any disparity as having to do with racism and sexism. It imposes a narrative onto data. Rather than simply reporting racial differences in pregnancy-related deaths, intersectional research exposes, exposes, it, it reads into the data systemic racism and sexism as the mechanism driving these differences. Moreover, th so this is motivated reasoning. This is anti-science. Moreover, intersectionality theory is not limited to research on individuals that hold multiple stigmatized identities. That word stigmatized already casts these identities in this privilege oppression rubric. They're always already projecting their narrative onto everything that they see. Intersectionality theory can and should also be applied to analyses of power and oppression among groups that experience compounded advantage, such as white men, and how their positionality may be complicated if they have hidden, stigmatized identities, e.g. low-income origins. Remember, we're talking about psychological science. So when you go in and you read every given data point as having to do with a certain narrative, does that not determine how you are supposed to act on the data? So in psychology, how is intersectionality not just going to read the data, but then impose its narrative upon the methods in which psychology is pursuing some sort of psychological health? It will end up showing that everybody is a victim or an impressor. That's what it does. So then you have to read in psychology what happens when you have a mindset of an oppressor or of a victim. Does that lead to psychological health? It doesn't. It actually leads to a lot of very negative behavior. It makes you feel bad about everything. It makes you really angry. It makes you displace your own ability to be responsible for your behavior and your situation on these systems and on these other privileged classes. So not only does it project what it wants onto data, it also projects its mindset onto everybody that is processed through the processing of that data. In net, in aggregate, it's destructive to science and to psychology or to healthy outcomes of psychology. And again, I love this paper because it's very explicit about what intersectionality is about. To continue. As intersectionality moves into the center of psychological research, it is being depoliticized. Okay, this is their critique. It is being depoliticized, disconnected from its social justice frame, and diluted. What remains is focused on two or more identities without analyzing systems of power that undergird inequality and without agitating for systemic change. The completely vanilla version of intersectionality is that my identity as a white person comes with a certain amount of uh, societal, you know, uh, status. And then my position as a man has a bunch of status attached to it. And then all my other hidden identities underneath that have all these status effects too. So when you analyze my experience as a white man, you're going to have some real data that you're going to actually come up with that is not motivated reasoning. You can just say that there's probably a lot of social interactions that are affected by my status as a white male that are empirical. That is a gilded form. Is gilded the right term? Gelded. It's a gelded form of intersectionality. It's depoliticized. So what they want is that it. you have to analyze all data having to do with power, which is privilege and oppression, and then you need to agitate for systemic change. So once you see everything as 
relying on these unfair systems of advantage, then you need to agitate, you need to employ the narrative into action to change the system. Does science agitate for anything? It does, actually. Sci scientific understanding of the world has agitated a lot of systems, has agitated a lot of narratives. I believe that science would even agitate intersectionality by questioning and demanding data that its narrative is true in all cases, for all identities, and that its outcomes of its proposed changes would actually lead to the changes of having a more just world in the end. If you start with bad data or if you start with a narrative, that doesn't necessarily mean that what you wanted is going to be the outcome. Hell hath no fury like intentions that are so good that they can't doubt themselves and leads to hell in a highway and a handbasket. To continue, while this is more palatable to broad audiences, this gelded form of intersectionality. It is not intersectional research. Intersectionality without a central focus on structures of power and oppression and sans social justice foci undermines intersectionality's potential, stymies intersectional research in the field. I don't know if it's research anymore. I don't think you could call that research. If you're just going through and you're telling a story that's the same story with every given data point. That's no longer research, that's storytelling. And innervates its power to radically transform society. As mainstream psychology flattens intersectionality theory to only a discussion of overlapping identities, it is also being confused with related but distinct concepts such as minority stress and multiple jeopardy. That's probably a, a serious concept, but it sounds funny. Minority stress theory suggests that minoritized people are at an increased risk for mental health concerns due to the additional stress of prejudice and stigma. This concept was created to explain the disparate prevalence of mental health disorders found among lesbian, gay, and bisexual individuals compared to heterosexual individuals. That might be a valid concept, but again, with the social justice lens, it becomes problematic because you only ever read oppression as the cause of stress or of uh, of distress. So if you read every mental health disorder or mental health uh, problem that a lesbian, gay, and bisexual individual as owing to stress for being a minoritized individual or in a minoritized category so-called, you overlook other methods of correcting that mental distress by blaming it all on the system, so-called. It's one thing for a theory to describe one form of stress, but when it pushes itself to undergird all forms of distress, all forms of malfunction or dysfunction in an individual, it stops that individual from exploring other options and creating a healthy, uh, multifaceted understanding of what's going on inside of them and what's going on outside of them. Not saying that minority stress theory does that, but if it was treated as intersectionality wants to be treated, then it would have a very harmful effect on the people that it's uh, boxing in to this one story of why they feel the stress that they feel. To continue, minority stress theory seeks to understand the potential negative mental health effects of experiencing discrimination and internalized stigma, but does not explain how multiple minoritized identities interact and uniquely impact an individual's experience. This is in stark contrast to intersectionality theory's second core tenet that states, we cannot understand the subjective experience of one social group membership without understanding others. So it's all interdependent. Hmm. Additionally, while prejudice and stigma allude to larger societal structures that create and uphold identity-based biases, systemic oppression is not central to the theory and therefore is no call to action for dismantling systems of power and oppression. Because you don't have that narrative baked in, you don't have that activism coming out of it, and that's a problem for intersectionality. Multiple Jeopardy theory, yes, we get a definition, posits that each stigmatized identity one holds can be targeted for mistreatment, and therefore each of these identities compounds our risk 
for mistreatment. As a result, membership in multiple marginalized identity groups significantly increases one's risk for victimization, accumulated disadvantage, and subsequent psychological, physical, and occupational harm. Multiple jeopardy is a contrast to multiple advantages accrued by those with multiple privileged identities. Importantly, multiple jeopardy differs from intersectionality in that it specifically addresses the multiplicative multiplicative risk of harm because marginalized identities are targeted for victimization. But it is not beholden to the core tenets of intersectionality theory described in Table 1, which I haven't seen yet, and does not mandate social justice practice. Okay, so multiple jeopardy takes that vanilla form of intersectionality, but because it's not activist in nature, it's not enough. It doesn't go far enough. It doesn't agitate. We assert that empirical research in mainstream psychology that claims it is intersectional is actually using multiple jeopardy and minority stress frameworks and falls short of fully meeting the requirements of intersectionality theory. The misrepresentation and diluting of intersectionality theory both reflects and reifies biases regarding intersectionality theory and intersectionality scholars. So basically, uh, because activism is distinguished from science, it re reifies biases. So the bias of science of saying that you can't just read your narrative into things and then use that story that you told with the data to cause change, because people say that that's not science, that's shoving aside, that's marginalizing these poor little intersectionality theorists and researchers, so-called research. Isis Settles and colleagues argue that psychology has resisted intersectionality theory and that by subjecting it to epistemic exclusion, the field tightly restricts its invisibility, such that it is largely invisible in psychology and, when visible, reflects only a diluted and distorted form. As such, scholars rely on literature in psychological science to build their own intersectional research replicate research that, at best, uses a multiple jeopardy framework. Over time, the true definitions of intersectionality theory are lost, and disciplinary memory of its definition is limited. That's basically the core of this argument. They use that argument or that framework, that, that basic statement, to reread this other article and show that this other article doesn't actually, isn't actually intersectional. So this is people arguing for intersectionality. This is Nicole T. Buchanan and Lauren O. Wickland from Michigan State University Department of Psychology, East Lansing, Michigan, the United States. This is very explicit, saying exactly what intersectionality does, and it shows intersectionalists complaining about science not taking them seriously and not saying that what they're doing is science when they explicitly say that they're not doing science. <laughs> they're not doing research. They're reading into data, and I'm sure in that reading into data, they will brush aside data. Anything that contradicts their narrative won't be included in their so-called research. Intersectionality doesn't want to be falsified. It wants to read a story and produce a result, and that result is agitation in their own words. I think this is, it is so lovely that they're being so explicit. They're distilling it all down. This stuff is anti-science. It wants to infect every given discipline and make itself the core, the core principle, which is social justice, which reads this power dynamic of privilege and oppression in every inequality and then forces us to agitate for that correction by making everybody either a victim or an oppressor and then inverting that hierarchy. And the great question is, how does that work out in practice? The intersectionalists think that it will cause some sort of glory. It doesn't. It causes evergreen. Ultimately, this causes evergreen, whether dialed up to 11 like evergreen was or in this just weird shifting of goalposts and this erosion of community effort, this erosion of science. And this causing of division across all these classes that are now pitted in war because you're either privileged or oppressed. You can't get out of that because to get out of that means that you're no longer an intersectionalist or whatever.
you're doing something else and that is not allowed that's not allowed so I, I just thought that was fascinating and fabulous and I hope you guys are having a good holiday week but I'm going to wish you a Merry Christmas specifically or a Merry Merry Wokemas in general and I will talk to you all soon stay tuned lovely day <laughs>